Most of the time, Bach accepted the strict conditions of his contract. You are to cultivate in your daily life fear of God, sobriety, and love of peace, and to conduct yourself toward God, higher authority, and your superiors, as befits an honor-loving servant and organist. By the time he got back from this excursion, the authorities were quite annoyed that anyone would have the temerity to take such a long time away from their job. And besides, when he started to play the organ again, they began to hear some very strange notes creeping into his playing. No doubt, the sort of harmonies he had learned in Lübeck from listening to Buxtehude, harmonies which were most unfamiliar to the people of Arnstadt. How old was he when he would have said to himself, you know, I don't want to spend my whole life being a virtuoso, playing an instrument. I want to write music. By the age of 18, he had received a very distinguished position as an organist, and he also had written some music. And I think we would have to assume that around the age of 20, he made that decision to get really very seriously involved with writing music. Clearly, this is not a great work of art, and it was only recently placed here. There's considerable controversy about its appropriateness for this square. But it does seem to have a certain attitude which probably is appropriate to the attitude that Bach had when he lived in the city of Arnstadt. It's almost as if he is saying to the officials of the city, what do you expect of me? But it was not only with the officials that he had a hard time getting along. He also had a bit of difficulty with his own students. And part of that was simply because many of the students were actually older than he was. In this arcade over here, he was accosted by one of his students who took great exception to the fact that Bach had called him a nanny goat bassoonist. Bach was a very gallant man who chose to draw his sword and they were off. It never turned into a major scandal, but you can understand that the authorities took considerable exception to this kind of demeanor on the part of their new employee. The final indignity was one more complaint from the council. By what right had Bach recently caused a young maiden to be invited into the choir loft and let her make music there? Clearly, it was time to move on. In the first segment of the Stations of Bach, you have learned something about the political realities in Germany at the end of the 17th century. But even more importantly, you've learned something about the wonderful character of the Bach family. You see, in Germany, at the end of the 17th century, there was no semblance of unity. Germany, along with Italy, was one of the last countries in Europe to have any kind of political unification. There were lots of small realms with princes at the head of them, and these princes were vying with each other for a place in the sun. It is fair to say that the German people were aware of a certain cultural heritage that did unify them, but politically, they were a competitive lot. And as far as the reigning prince was concerned, he was eager to gather together some of the finest minds, some of the finest artists of his time to bring honor to his own little principality. It was not so much a question of having uh, more troops or having more money, but if you had cultural richness, that was something that would really distinguish you amongst your peers. So musicians, were honored by the princes that they served and the cities where they worked. Yet they didn't have the kind of status that we would connect uh, with what many musicians are looking for today in a democratic society. They were still considered in a way servants. That servitude was something that was not necessarily burdensome to them. It was just a fact that they were the musicians and they were serving the monarch. Flexibility of Art and of personality was very important at this time. The reigning princes believed that they should find musicians who could do just about anything. People who could write music for any occasion, people who could perform it, could train people, could be good models for the students that they taught. And this was of much greater importance than that those musicians be specifically geniuses in one realm. This, again, is very different from today. A young music student is told, now, make sure that you can specialize in something and be very good at it, if possible, be better than anybody else. And then you will be very employable. 
In box time, if you were only good at one thing, that lessened the likelihood that you would be employed. Bach learned this from his father and from other members of his family, that this versatility was desirable. But Bach's genius of actually writing music was something which most of his employers found to be a sort of secondary convenience. They didn't expect him to write nearly the amount of music that he did. They gave him many different duties, some of which Bach found perfectly agreeable, and others of which he found rather annoying, like teaching Latin, one of the duties that he managed to farm out to other people as much as possible. But these very duties, even though Bach may have found them occasionally annoying, were something that with his positive attitude, he used to build his own art. He didn't say, oh, if only people would leave me alone so I could compose. He composed anyway, and he composed with power and with resourcefulness, and he used all of his knowledge in his compositions. You see, in the end of the 17th century, Germany was still somewhat in the old guild system, where if you were a musician, you were likely the son of a musician and the grandson of a musician, and you were proud of being a musician. Today, too often people see their father or their mother doing something that is boring or tedious or in some way not particularly savory, and they say, well, I'm going to go into some other profession. But coming out of the Middle Ages, even as late as the end of the 17th century, musicians like Bach would have been proud to be the son of a musician and wanted to go forth and make music even better than their father and their grandfather. It was music then that really knit together this family. And also, it was faith. These were two things that were unquestioned. Bach never doubted that he was a Lutheran, and he never doubted that he was a musician. And the two worked very, very closely together. This gave him a sense of identity and a sense of confidence. When he lost both father and mother, you would have thought that he would have been most adrift. But he had an older brother who immediately came along and was willing to help teach him. And by the time he was 18 years old, he was already very well known as an organist in a relatively large area. And by the time he was 20, he said, I want to be a composer. And he was sure of it, something that's most rare. Now, in the next segment, we are going to take you to the city of Mühlhausen, and then from there to the city of Weimar and to the city of Kürten. These smaller towns were places where Bach was able to develop his flexible skills and where he continued to nourish his determination, above all, to be a composer.